Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union on ThinkTech Live. We, I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and thank you for joining me today. And my guest, Dennis Boloka with the Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group. Unfortunately, we are here discussing war is over. We must unite for Ukraine now, live for liberty for a free world tomorrow. The world is currently facing the gravest danger to the common good with Russia invading Ukraine. The global democracy movement rooted in rule of law and human rights is demanding self-determination of all peoples around the planet. And Ukraine is a fledgling democracy dedicated to freedom and liberty, demanding a better future in Europe. The illegal invasion violated the UN Charter Article 2.4 and it requires a united response recognizing the human right of all people of Ukraine, of Ukraine beginning with the right to life. Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for doing all that you did prior on human rights and currently do today. Yeah, thank you for inviting, Joshua. Where were you six days ago when the illegal invasion began? I know your hometown is Kharkiv. Yeah, obviously I was in Kharkiv. I was in my office, the office of Kharkiv Human Rights Protection Group. We have uh, night shifts and uh, I was on one of the night shift this day and uh, I, I was tired the day before, evening before I uh, I was asleep uh, about eight o'clock in the evening and uh, and woke up in the morning about 5 a.m. and then I started to read the news and realized that uh, there is a war and uh, this is it. I, I sat on my bicycle and uh, rode around to, to look around and uh, I saw myself the, the signs of bombing, of bombing the objects on, on the Kharkiv borderlands. I think it was military objects. And uh, I called my friend and uh, said uh, that war, war began and uh, we started to think what to do next. We, are, uh, we were trying to evacuate ourselves from the city as far west as possible, but uh, we ended up in the city of Sumo. It's about, I don't know, 200 kilometers from Kharkiv, and uh, now there's no transport communication. I think there are no trains, and uh, we are uh, sort of stuck here and <laughs> trying to live our usual, more or less usual lives and to, uh, to fight in some way in this war because this is. Uh, not just a war between two fighting sides between armed forces. It's a war between. It's a war with all the Ukrainians, all the forty millions of Ukrainian people, uh, as I see it today. Yeah, no, the bravery and beauty of Ukraine, standing up for self determination and freedom, has really been an inspiration to the world. And Ukraine has become the front line in a struggle, not just between democracies and autocracies, but also maintaining a rule-based system where countries are not taken by force. So every country in the world should be paying close attention to this. And it's while it's happening, it's definitely weighing heavy on many hearts. And there's devastating consequences for all citizens of the world. It's really a war against freedom. And as you said, these airstrikes by the Russian military are against civilians. And so much is happening. Could you share a little bit about what you've heard about Kharkiv? I know just recently there's been a lot of bombing of civilian spaces, many children dying. Yeah, today, yeah, today, because I'm kind of confused with the dates, day of the weeks. And uh, today is the March 1st. Uh, this is an interesting story about Kharkiv because uh, you probably heard of uh, bombing the 
administrative building in the, in the very center of Kharkiv, the main square, the Freedom Square, by the way. Uh, and uh, eight years ago, on March 1st, um, 2014, there were some buses that came here from Belgorod, nearby city in Russia, with uh, their agents in civilian uh, uniform. They seized this building and uh, the Russia, Russian flag was uh, raised by Moscow citizen, by the way. Uh, that time they failed with establishing some kind of republic, uh, proclaimed republic here, but uh, now from 21st of February, they're trying to, um, to concur the Kharkiv again, they, are, they were bombing. They, they came here not in the buses, but in the tanks. And uh, they obviously failed again because there are many people, not just armed forces, but the territorial defense, the voluntary um, battalions. Um, my, my roommate, uh, this second year university student, uh, he's now fighting in the, as, as a volunteer on the war. And uh, uh, they probably went angry when, when they see that uh, they, they are losing this again. They, they cannot seize the city of Kharkiv again. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, this is just a vendetta. Um, they decided to bomb the main building. They they think probably if, if we cannot seize it, we we can destroy it. And they have uh, launched in I think 9 a.m. Um, a few uh, few missiles from the nearby city or the Russian ter territory itself because it's, it's pretty close here in Kharkiv, about 30 kilometers to, to the Russian border. And they can launch uh, the, the rockets from, from their systems, like Uragan or Grad, BM-20, BM-28, Soviet uh, rockets launch systems. And, um, yeah, they they were taking civilian objects, uh, neighborhoods of Kharkiv. Uh, when I, where I personally used to live, uh, now it's destroyed, and uh, many of civilian casualties. And uh, yeah, this is terrible, and we do not have any other way, except of fight for our freedom and for democracy. Yeah, the entire pretext of Putin saying he was going to need Nazification as a pretext for invading Ukraine and then hitting the historical Ukrainian Jewish town of Uman. And of course, Vladimir Zelensky, of course, is also Jewish. It, it's just horrible. But it's been great to see Zelensky standing up saying we are here to counter the misinformation. His statement, uh, the fight is here, I need ammunition, not a ride. It, it has galvanized people inside Ukraine and also around the world. You see Sweden switching its neutrality, German pacifism also changing its perspective. And even Switzerland has made sure that they've gone from neutral to then holding and putting the funds under hold what else do you think the world should do regarding what's happening right now, especially with that 67 kilometer long armored vehicles heading towards Kiev now? What, what can the world do to assist and what are you asking for that must be done now? Um, the, main, the main demand from Ukrainians now is, I think, you know, the hashtag uh, close the sky to NATO to, to cover the Ukraine from the sky and uh, our armed force can cover the ground. 
Uh, obviously, I, I think it's uh, it's unrealistic to talk about NATO troops here in Ukraine because uh, of international law, as as it seems to be, uh, it, should, it should be the decision of uh, United Nations uh, Security Council and. Russia is one of the constant members of uh, United Nations Security Council, and, and this is a, a big problem. And Ukraine, Ukrainian representative in UN said, uh, "Can you show me the documents uh, that caused Russia to to be a constant member here? Because uh, there was the Soviet Union and Russia." As successor of Soviet Union, it's it's kind kind, kind of uh, mad thing mm. as we see it today. Uh, as uh, as my president said uh, to Amer to Americans when they proposed him to evacuate him to from Ukraine, he said, "I don't need a jet. I need armor." And this is a scene. We need. You can, NATO cannot provide, and Western countries cannot provide to Ukraine with uh, uh, living, living troops, but uh, they can provide us with, uh, with the ammunition, with their uh, Bayraktar, uh, what else, uh, Javelin or other system, systems that uh, seems to be very effective here against Russia troops, Russian troops and uh, Ukraine recently established an international legion. Uh, so uh, the citizens from all around the world can, uh, can, can be a part of, of, of this army and to fight against occupants. Thank you, so, yeah. and, and of course, uh, we need to uh, we need to create uh, heavy economic pressure on Russia, uh, as as we're trying to do to to turn off the SWIFT, to turn off Visa, Mastercard payments, to block uh, the Russian central bank uh, foreign accounts, and uh, maybe. Trade ban and other economical sanctions. No, well, you've covered a lot, and especially it is the violation of the UN Charter that it's not with NATO, but that the UN has a responsibility from that UN Charter created in San Francisco in 1945. Article 24 prohibits the threat and use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And so it's really important to focus on that aspect. I also have noticed the way that Zelensky and your diplomatic corps have also looked at what's going on by bringing up issues beyond the UN Charter, but using all the international instruments. The, you brought up the exact point that the UN Security Council, since Russia sits there as a permanent member, can veto any resolution there. But what has been powerful is to see what has been done in other aspects. The, important thing that was done was raising it at the Human Rights Council session that began on Monday. And tomorrow there'll be an urgent debate on Russia. There's also a move to remove Russia from the Human Rights Council since it violated the essence of what it means to be a member of the Human Rights Council by its acts daily of killing and actually committing war crimes and acts of aggression violating the International Criminal Court as well. And there will be the discussion tomorrow and there will be a call for a commission of inquiry to document all of the war crimes, all of the human rights violations to then use to hold military and political leaders accountable for what has happened. The last one I, I see also is Ukraine submitted an application to the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And they're yep. raising the situation under uh, genocide convention. So a lot is happening. And I think that's the most important thing. The other last point was 
the Security Council voted to convene a special session to address the crisis. And that's just the 10th time that's happened since 1950. So Ukraine is being very active. But what we see, of course, is what breaks our hearts of innocent people being killed for doing nothing at all. And I think what we have to understand for the rest of the world is we can't allow Russia to flex on the rest of us if the rest of us are fueled literally and figuratively by the non sources of power, we should connect with making all these points known that the oil and the gas of Russia should be moved away from, that we can go towards actually seeking climate justice, but also making sure that we work towards world peace together and that we stand with Ukraine against fascism, against violence, and all those who are against this war. Uh, you know, I recently I've got a book uh, written by a book from Amazon, written by former uh, Canadian Canadian general uh, Romeo Deller. Oh, yeah. uh, it's called it's called Shake Hands with the Devil. Uh, it's about genocide in Rwanda, and uh, uh, it's it's a terrible book uh, because. Uh, even the assistant of uh, Colonel Deller uh, committed suicide during assisting him in writing this book, even even though she wasn't in Rwanda herself. But this this event is so terrible; he he just can't can't do with it. And uh, I I very loved this phrase, uh, this name. This very name of this book, and uh, I think this is uh, what was happening in these eight years between West and uh, Russia. It's it's uh, shake hands with the devil, and um, um, there were some genocides in 19. It's Rwanda, it's Srebrenica, uh, and uh, I think we don't need another genocide here in Ukraine. And uh, there are a lot of critic uh, to the United Nations uh, about uh, the ability of, of UN to respond uh, to, to this cause, to these problems. And uh, this is really a question. Can the United Nations uh, really solve these problems uh, nowadays. That's an excellent point. I've actually taught that book. So I know exactly what you're talking about. That shaking hand with the devil is we have to connect all the consequences and we have to connect what the results are. And too many people have just been in pursuit of wealth and not thinking about the deals they're doing. The oil companies with Russia, Shell, all of those have huge implications because then that emboldens dictators. And what we really have to do and what I think about is we should all be in agony today because people are dying because they want to live in a democracy. They want to determine their own affairs. But we should then build on that agony to produce real change. And the UN has weaknesses because of it giving a veto to the permanent five and other aspects. But it also has an opportunity to organize. And we see the, there are so many elements of the UN. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, is organizing and documenting the violations. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, over 660,000 have already gone into Poland. I think one of the most heartening aspects was the signs that say, we welcome you, not in a way trying to turn anyone away, but saying, we welcome you and everyone coming to volunteer. I know a chef, Jose Andres uh, from Spain, he actually mobilized his World Central Kitchen and it has it functioning right now in Poland to help people, of course, the temperatures are freezing and we can see people all around the world beginning to take action. And even the EU this morning, your president was there speaking to them and seeking membership there. So the world is beginning to react, but I believe what you're calling for and what we all agree with is every life is precious and any death that happens should 
be taken action to avoid. It's important that FIFA and UEFA are banning Russia, tossing it out of the World Cup, that everyone's taking actions, but we have to make sure that the UN could function to prevent innocent lives dying in the future under that right to protect. When we see all those tanks lining up that will commit crimes against humanity, there must be action to help and help now. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and uh, Ukraine indeed uh, have sent, uh, I don't know how, how to say it correct, but uh, the problem is uh, that we haven't yet ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. So the court um, have not, uh, the court don't have the full, um, the, the full right to investigate the crimes here in Ukraine, but they uh, actually started to do it, and uh, um, we, we we should follow it and see what will be in the future. Uh, it's a uh, many brilliant uh, thing um, things about uh, Ukrainians that I learned in recent days. Um, this uh, this war shows uh, to me personally that there are many of brilliant people's people here all of them really but uh, i think one of the interesting things for me that uh, in ukraine here we do not have any censorship because of war uh, usually you know i'm a big fan of first amendment and uh, it's uh, it's it's a popular topic whether we should uh, introduce some um, some ban to freedom of the speech of the press uh, or, or not. And now we've I think the state uh, just uh, have no time to introduce some censorship law or things like that. And uh, the Putin's regime should uh, spend uh, millions or just billions of dollars to mm, to silence the the voice of the truth and to to introduce the 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 truth in 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 their way. And we here in Ukraine don't need a penny to uh, because uh, the order is is just self organized here. Uh, the police shouldn't uh, uh, arrest people for protesting against war or things like that because uh, everyone is united here, really. Well, that's a great point. And what you're sharing, it has been exciting to see people organize. And I even remember the signs that people organized to make sure an action that had taken place in World War II as well, nonviolent protest to change all of the signs so that the Russian soldiers coming in would not know where to go. And of course, it also shows the humor of the, and the, the strength and wisdom of go keep yourself here, go keep yourself over there, and then go keep yourself back to Russia. And so that perspective of not giving up and everyone doing something is really important. And that's what we see is, everyone around the world sort of uniting to do things. You have uh, pizzerias, even Las Vegas, replacing vodka with Ukrainian vodka, proceeds going to humanitarian relief. You have many people organizing. And what is important though is, it is a, as you pointed out, really a war against universal values that you're citing the first amendment and freedom of speech and freedom of press is absolutely important because you even see that cracking in Russia. You see the university where all the foreign service officers that make the policy of Russia have actually signed letters to protest. You see people protesting also inside Moscow and St. Petersburg. So around domestically, where most people were fearful to rise up, are rising up but it's the inspiration by the everyday people in Ukraine that are getting more people to see what they can do. 
one person asked a question. He said, would one wish that fellow democratic cultures of the EU not quote, just support morally through welcoming fleeing Ukrainians and through weapons, but also join physically defending democracy? Have you seen a lot of people coming and doing actions there that you would call for people to support, to assist, to defend democracy? You know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not seeing them physically because I'm you know, on the very east of the country, and they obviously should come from the west, from the western borders. But uh, the support that we are seeing here is is huge. Uh, a lot of uh, foreign friends or people that we know, or journalists. Uh, wrote, wrote uh, asked our organizations, and uh, uh, they they are proposing help. They are asking about uh, bank accounts, um, and they they are showing their support for Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, it is important to see the massive international condemnation of the Russian aggression, but between us, we know it's not enough. We know that we have to now punish the perpetrators, but also deter future threats to international peace and security. And those accompanying commissions of mass atrocities that you were sharing as well. We have to take action today. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, I think that uh, first days of war in the West uh, is really, uh, Mm, they they wasn't sure about uh, they weren't sure about whether Ukraine can fight Russia and uh, it's it uh, it seemed like uh, it's 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 a huge power of Russia the, the second army in the world but uh, the next days the five days of the war showed that. Uh, we can we can't really handle it, uh, even without uh, any support from the West or small small support. And the West, uh, Western countries uh, realized that uh, it's not uh, this is a war we we are not losing, and uh, and we all can be. Uh, we all are really uh, a part of this world. We can uh, we can we can make a victory more close. No, thank you. And your ambassador Markarova also said that you know it's your job to defend your country and it's your home and you will defend it. But more importantly, to show. Russia, that it's not okay in the 21st century to attack another country, a sovereign country, without any reason. And that telling the rest of the world it's time to take sides and it's time to take the Ukrainian side because you're defending your home. And really, I know we only have one more minute. The world and all of our viewers must understand what this war means for Ukraine, for Europe, but for the world as a whole. And we have to think about the scenarios, but we also have to make sure that the leaders of the free world respond resolutely because this will ripple around the not only the region, but the rest of the world. And we thank you for your courage and bravery. And we look forward to continue communicating and as well as when the war is over to make sure that the human rights that your group supports are realized by all people of Kharkiv, as well as all of Ukraine. Mahalo, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too, Joshua. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, 
Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.